Thank you all so much for being here. I'm Lisa Guernsey. I'm director of the teaching, learning, and tech team at New America and a co-author of the report that we're going to be talking about today. We have a terrific program on tap for you with some inspiring leaders and thinkers in the world of digital equity, libraries, and education. And it's been really exciting to see the response to this event. Um, we had hundreds and hundreds of RSVPs and are already reaching more than 175 people who are joining us right this moment. So just a big thank you to all of you for being here. Our hashtag on Twitter is hashtag libraries digital shift. And that hashtag is just one of the key findings in this new study of how the pandemic has affected the use of libraries, including the downstream effect of what happened when people couldn't enter library buildings to get internet access. So we're gonna talk about that much more in a moment, but I first want to introduce and thank Doran Weber of the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. This report could not have happened without the foundation's support, and we're just so grateful for the chance to do this research. Doran is Vice President and Program Director at the Sloan Foundation. He runs the Program for the Public Understanding of Science, Technology, and Economics at Sloan, which uses diverse media, books, radio, television, film, theater, new media, to bridge the two cultures of science and the humanities. Um, and I know he's been a huge supporter of research related to digital access. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Doran, with just deep gratitude for your support of this project. Thank you, Lisa. And it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, just briefly, Sloan is a uh, nonprofit philanthropy. We make grants for research and education in science, technology, and economics. And this grant falls under a different program that I run called Universal Access to Knowledge. And the goal is to harness advances in digital information technology to make the fruits of scientific and cultural knowledge available for the widest public benefit under fair and secure conditions. Now, I know that's a mouthful. We've supported things from Wikipedia for 12 years now. We helped them scale up and the Digital Public Library of America, which John Bracken is here to represent and have been big supporters of libraries. Um, and, and recently, we're also very concerned with privacy and security, those are the range of issues. We are really thrilled about this report. I wanna congratulate Lisa and New America Foundation because A, they were on time, B, they went into the community and got us real information from, I think it was 2,620 people. So, you know, we, we always need to be up to date and obviously COVID has changed uh, a lot of things and, and uh, the report is very illuminating and obviously we need to do a better job regarding inclusivity, especially towards people of color, lower income people. We think libraries are, we subscribe to the Palaces of the People School they are, as you all know, free, non-commercial, neutral spaces. Um, and I would just add to the inclusivity uh, banner, the, uh, the notion that we're, li we're living in very polarized times and would it be also good to include people who don't always agree with us or see everything the same way. I think libraries can do all of that. They have a huge role. And with that, I'm gonna look forward to this wonderful panel. Thank you again to Lisa and the New America Foundation. It's our pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Doran. So we're going to jump into a discussion of the report for about 15 minutes or so, and then we're going to turn it over to a panel for um, an, a, a deeper dive and conversation about it. And I just want to say thanks to everyone who's been putting their hellos into the chat. It's really exciting to see folks from all over the country um, in the library and education world and beyond. So if you can move us to the next slide, Angela. Give us a start here on this. So what we are trying to do with this report is to really better understand what the pandemic has meant to people all over the world who may have relied on and may not have known about but are now starting to understand what public libraries could offer. So I want to start by just casting our minds back to the summer of 2020, a few months into the pandemic, and it's about when we started planning this study. Public buildings were closed, including libraries. Students were taking all of their classes remotely all of a sudden. Millions of Americans were and still are trying to run their lives almost entirely online. And meanwhile, reliable health information and other kinds of information were desperately needed and jobs were halted and hours reduced. So finding hubs 
for reliable and trustworthy online information was more important than ever. And libraries were working very hard to serve that need. And let me note just for a moment that New America has for several years been keeping a collection of articles and reports on how libraries are adapting in this time of rapid technological and social change. And one of my colleagues will put a link to that collection in the, in the chat for us here. But what we wanted to know in doing this study was whether people across the United States knew about what their libraries were offering, knew about the free online resources and ebooks and other information that libraries had. Would they find this material? Would they use these, these resources when they were stuck at home? Would they have the internet access at home that was adequate enough to be able to tap into this? And what would happen to those who relied on the library's free Wi-Fi or computer labs, but who now could no longer easily get online because those services were closed to them? So we conducted a multi-pronged study in the fall and the winter of, of 2020. Just a few months ago, we tried to move this as quickly as we could to get this data out as timely as possible. We conducted surveys to try to find answers to these questions, and we gathered data on how or if people were discovering, accessing, and using their public libraries during the COVID-19 pandemic. We focused on libraries materials that were available online, but we also talked to library leaders across the country about how they were dealing with the crisis. So next slide, Angela. So as we embarked on this study, we couched these questions in the context of the pandemic, of course, but we also really wanted to make sure we acknowledge the reality before the pandemic. We are in this always on, always connected world now, and, and that's been happening in part of our lives for well over a decade, information available seemingly anywhere at any time. And it had already raised questions about what libraries should do to best serve their communities. Here on screen, for example, is a finding from a 2016 survey and report by John Horrigan of the Pew Research Center. And we are really fortunate to have John with us today as a moderator for our first panel. So you're gonna hear, hear from John very soon. And in addition to what libraries are facing and had been facing even before the pandemic, the so-called digital divide had been of course looming large. There are some that thought, oh, everyone's fine, right? We now all have smartphones. Um, we don't really need to worry about this. That was not the case at all as many, many reports have shown since. Um, so big questions have loomed about who was able to get online via a high speed connection and could really get online in a way that could help them get their work done or um, take courses or learn about the world. My colleague, Claire Park of the Open Technology Institute and a co-author on the port is with us here to give a little bit more context from that perspective on digital equity. So Claire, let me turn it over to you now. Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Claire. I work at the Open Technology Institute where I focus on issues including broadband access and consumer privacy. Um, and like Lisa said, um, just to give some background, libraries and schools are institutions that struggle with the same problem that um, low-income households and households um, of people of color struggle with, which is cost. Um, the broadband marketplace is really distinguished by high costs. Um, our cost of connectivity research um, and report published last year found that um, the, on average, internet costs about $68.38 a month. Um, and this is a huge um, burden for families who are already struggling to pay for other essential utilities, um, pay for food, et cetera. Um, so uh, there's a connection that um, Savia will um, expand upon later, but um, between income and high cost and internet adoption. But um, agencies like the Federal Communications Commission has found that on average, uh, the proportion of the population with access to different speeds of service is highest in counties with predictably the highest median household income and the lowest poverty rates. Um, one survey from 2019 found that 51% of 6 million US households with uh, annual incomes under $25,000, uh, which is pretty low, did not have home internet um, explicitly because it was too expensive for them to afford. Um, so lower household income and higher poverty directly affect the ability to afford service at home. And I'll turn it back to Lisa. Thanks so much, Claire. And yeah, if you, as you see on the next slide, Angela will show you here some of the points that Claire was making about the affordability of internet at home, which as I think many of you in the chat are noting right now as well, this really is something that 
those two of us who've studied this were aware of, but it, I think, it was not something that most um, Americans uh, were aware of until the pandemic hit, just, just how much of a, of a barrier this is for many people. So if we go to the next slide, I want to tell you now about how we got started on our study. Um, and I want to first just say a big thank you to Ann Duffett, our survey consultant on this. Um, she's with FDR Group, and we really could not have done this without her expertise. So a big thanks to Ann. Our methodology included a nationally representative survey of the general public. Um, and in that, we had 2,620 respondents that was collected um, from, conducted from September 25th to October 13th. 13th of 2020. We also um, inter uh, surveyed educators and those who work in community-based organizations who work with constituents who are, are in the process of, of learning at whatever age they are. So we did that survey to just better understand where people who might be the connectors stood and what they were understanding about public libraries. And then we uh, also did interviews with library leaders at select sites around the country. So if you go to the next slide, there's a couple of um, notes here about that survey of the general public, which is where you're going you know, to hear most of our findings today. Um, as, as you see here on this slide, 88% of our respondents said that they had high speed access. Oh yeah, if you can go back. Sorry, thank you. Um, yeah, if you, yeah, sorry. So 88% said that they have access at home to high speed internet. Um, and I want to note, and this I think is really important as we're talking about um, disparities, that um, that number is higher than what you see in other surveys, such as those that Pew has done in terms of who has access to broadband access at home. Um, and that's in part because this survey, we did it online, um, partly because of our need for speed. Uh, but we want to recognize that doing it online meant that we're leaving people out. So what we believe is that the results you're going to hear about today may in fact undercount the prevalence of the challenges that people are maybe having in gaining access to online services. Also of note um, is this other number on the slide here, 15%. This was the percentage of our respondents who said that they lost their main source of internet access when libraries had to close. Okay, so if you go to the next slide, now we can start to talk about what we found in this study. We, some of the big takeaways were mixed awareness of public libraries online resources, a shift towards online resources, positive attitudes about the public library, and disparities in access to those line, the online resources that the library has. If you go to the next slide, Angel. First, we found that respondents have positive attitudes about their public libraries, which I think is notable <laughs> given that, and as Doran pointed out as well, these days one is hard pressed to find an institution, particularly a public institution that the general public regards favorably. Um, uh, and this is across you know, a, a variety of different kind of viewpoints and political um, leanings. Next slide. So we also found that respondents have a positive uh, sorry, so here's the data on the positive impression. 76% of our respondents had a positive impression. Next slide, please. We also saw evidence of a digital shift. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see our data on that. We've asked people um, when, whether they used a website or app from their public library before COVID-19 hit, and that number was 28%. And then we asked if they had done that since the pandemic and the number jumped to 39%. So what gets interesting is how those numbers start to shake out when you take into account demographic differences among our sample. And that is gonna lead me to pass the mic now to Sabia Prescott, who's a policy analyst um, and a colleague of mine at New America. And she's gonna walk us through those results. So turning it over to you, Sabia. Thank you, Lisa. Can we go to the next slide? So as Lisa mentioned, my name is Sabia Prescott and I'm a policy analyst on our education policy team here at New America. So this next set of findings that I'll talk about here uh, showed a number of interesting results, including some expected and some unexpected relationships between the use of online resources and particular demographic categories, right, such as income, age, and race. So starting with the first, our results showed a positive relationship or correlation between income and the use of online library resources. Next slide. 
So as you can see in the chart here, the higher the income that respondents reported, the more likely they were to also report using their library's website or app, both before and since the start of COVID-19. And though it's not depicted in this chart, we also found that the higher income that respondents reported, the more likely they were to answer yes when asked if there is a public library in their area that offers online resources. Next slide. The second relationship that the survey results uncovered was between age and the use of online library resources. Interestingly, this relationship was not so linear. Next slide. As this table shows, respondents who reported being between 30 and 44 years of age were most likely to report using their library's website or app since the start of COVID-19. Respondents 18 to 29 were a close second, and those 60 years and older were the least likely group to have reported using a library website or app. At the same time, data also showed that the older the respondent, the more likely they were to report having a positive overall view of the public library, the less likely they were to report having difficulties navigating the library's website, and the less likely they were to report having relied on the library as their main source of internet before the pandemic. As Lisa and Claire both mentioned, that last bit is part of a larger set of findings that I'll talk more about in a couple of slides. Next slide. But first, lastly, on this piece, survey results also showed clear trends in the use of online library resources by racial demographics. Next slide. Like the previous findings underscoring experiences of respondents with economic privilege, the findings also showed that there are racial disparities in those who experience issues navigating libraries, websites, and apps, uh, finding the resources that they need, and sometimes having the physical tools just to access them at all, such as devices and Wi-Fi. So overall white respondents were less likely to report needing help navigating their library's website or app and less likely to report experiencing technical or connectivity issues. Black and African-American respondents were the least likely group to report having no issues getting online from their public library. And they were also the most likely to report internet connectivity issues when attempting to access online resources. Next slide. Now, last, now, last but not least, excuse me, some of the most important findings in the report we thought were the differences between respondents who reported losing their main source of internet when libraries shut down in-person operations back in March of last year in 2020 and those who did not. So data show key differences in both populations, folks who lost their internet and in use, how and for what purposes these two groups use the library resources. Next slide. So first survey results show demographic differences between those who lost their main source of internet and those who did not. As you can see, those who reported relying on the library for their primary source of internet were more likely to be male, to live in an urban area, to speak a language other than English at home, and to be Hispanic, Black, or African American. For example, 39% of respondents you can see here who reported losing their main source of internet when library closures uh, happened back in March, also reported speaking a language other than English at home. This is compared to 18% of respondents who uh, did not rely on the library as their main source of internet. Next slide. And finally, the in addition to differences between those who lost the internet and those who did not, again, survey data show that those who did were much more likely to rely on the library to meet critical needs, such as accessing information related to employment, education, or healthcare. They were less likely to use the library uh, for personal enjoyment only than those who access the internet at home or elsewhere. Again, for example, you can see here that 35% of people who lost the internet when libraries shut down relied on the internet, relied on internet access at libraries for work or professional development compared to only 21% of those who access internet at home or elsewhere. Next slide. So each of the findings that Lisa and I just described here um, were results from the general population survey that we conducted as part of this study. But for the last part, and to get kind of a clearer sense of what this work looks like uh, for library leaders in this moment, we talked to folks working to address some of these digital disparities right now. And what we heard was a number of examples of innovative approaches to community engagement and online programming during the pandemic, including uh, mobile Wi-Fi vans, right, new virtual tools and types of programs, shifting operations outdoors where folks can engage safely and the use of digital navigators to help facilitate digital and media literacy. Each of these stories is included in full in our report. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Claire to walk through some of our recommendations. Yes, so can we move on to the next slide? 
Um, great, yeah. So uh, first, starting with recommendations that we make through the report for policymakers. Um, number one, just um, investing in efforts by libraries and schools to bring internet access to patrons and students. Um, there are a number of ways to do this. Uh, for instance, there's an existing federal program called E-Rate, um, which allows for federal funding to go to these institutions so that they can get their patrons and students connected. Um, another approach is to lower the cost of home broadband. Uh, like I mentioned, the costs are pretty high right now, and subsidies are one way to go about helping people afford them. But another way to um, helping people afford internet is to make it more affordable. So um, one solution would be to introduce more competition into the marketplace. Uh, the broadband um, sphere is pretty heavily saturated right now by a number of key providers. I'm sure you you all are familiar with which uh, those company names are. Um, so um, allowing for um, communities, for instance, to build their own municipal broadband networks is a great way of lowering um, costs. Uh, another approach is to encourage uh, community-based organizations, um, CBOs, libraries, and schools to work together uh, to develop grant programs and other in incentives for collaboration will allow um, each other to all these institutions to communicate on what the needs are and, and how they can help. Um, we also need investment and funding in tech support programs like digital navigators that um, help build uh, literacy skills and help people um, get to know how to use the internet and devices. Um, and finally, um, supporting and funding needs assessments and other research on public library use, uh, specifically by marginalized or underserved communities, will allow us to figure out better how to reach these communities and also um, what, what they need, um, what their needs are. So if we can go to the next slide. Uh, we continue with some recommendations for libraries specifically, um, focusing on improving awareness of resources. So this would include targeting outreach and communication with underserved, low income, Black, Hispanic, and Asian households, um, and also patrons who don't speak English. Um, this, you know, building websites where um, people that are more accessible, um, that are in multiple languages, uh, will really help. Um, offering mobile options that bring the library to underserved communities rather than requesting that underserved communities go to libraries will also help expand um, awareness and use of resources and supporting, like we said, digital and media literacy programs like digital navigators um, and other mentoring initiatives to help build, um, help patrons build necessary skills will also um, improve awareness and also improve um, actual ability to take advantage of these uh, public resources. So I'll turn it back to Lisa for the last set of recommendations. Great, thanks so much, Claire. And so the, if you go to the next slide, we have just a few more recommendations and that's for educators and leaders of community-based organizations. We saw in our, in our surveys with educators that there's perhaps a need to deepen partnerships between libraries and community-based organizations and schools as noted in the previous recommendation. And also to ensure that library leaders are engaged in strategic planning um, across all sorts of different um, resources that are available in the community. So if you go to the next slide, um, I just want to say a big thanks to Claire and to Sabia, my co-authors on this report. Um, it was a lot of a lot of work and also a lot of fun to work on this with both of you. And of course, say a big uh, thanks to our work group for this. Um, and I'm just going to many of them are here with us and um, were with us from the beginning in terms of designing the survey. Paula Balboa from the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, John Bracken with Digital Public Library of America, Amanda Lenhart with Data and Society Research Institute, Donnell Probst with the National Association for Media Literacy Education, and Kelvin Watson, now director of the Las Vegas Clown. Uh, Clark County Library District. Um, just a huge thanks to all of you and Ann Duffett um, and to Alfred P. P. Sloan Foundation as well. So we now are going to be able to move over to our panel. And I'm just really um, excited to introduce uh, you to John Horrigan, who is a senior fellow at the Technology Policy Institute. He's conducted research on and written many national reports on these issues. We relied on his research quite a bit in our, in our piece, and we're just incredibly grateful, John, to what you've been doing over the past um, decade or more on these issues. Um, he was previously a senior researcher at Pew Research Center, and prior to that served as research director for the development of the National Broadband Plan at the Federal Communications Commission. So John, on. I'm going to turn it over to you and say thanks to you and the panel. There's a lot to unpack here, and we're looking forward to the conversation. Thanks. 
Great. Thank you very much, Lisa. And thanks to you and all your colleagues at the New America Foundation for really an outstanding report. We have now a panel of distinguished experts in the field to comment on the report. Uh, we have with us John Bracken of the Digital Public Library of America, Jean-Claude Brizard of Digital Promise, Tracy Hall of the American Libraries Association, and Kelvin Watson of the Las Vegas Clark County District Library. I wanted, before we get going with our panelists, just make a reflection or two on the New America Report in light of some of the work I've done in the past. And just two things uh, struck me. One is libraries have faced the pandemic as, as they have faced a decades plus long challenge to adapt to a new world where digital resources are more, more pervasive. At the same time, public libraries have a heavy weight of public expectations to meet a variety of needs. So the public expects libraries to go digital. They also expect libraries to do the things that they've always done in terms of being a physical presence in a community. Another point, which uh, I think both Lisa and Doran both raised earlier on, is just how trusted public libraries are as institutions in this country. At the Pew Research Center, we asked, what are the most trustworthy institutions asking respondents to compare across a variety of different institutions, healthcare institutions, government at all level, financial institutions, and libraries took the prize as the most highly trusted institutions. So they have an incredibly important role to play, uh, especially at a time of national crisis. So with that, I want to turn to our panel. How we're gonna proceed is to go in alphabetical order, asking folks to give about four minutes overview on their reactions to the report and other reactions they may have on this topic. And after that, we'll have a conversation and reserve some time for Q&A. So with that, I turn it over to John Bracken. John? Thank you, John. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, congratulations to the New America team. I know that Claire, Savia, and, and Lisa put a lot, lot into this and, and, and it shows. Um, so first, I, so I'm at the Digital Public Library of America. For those of you who don't know us, we are nearly an eight-year-old effort designed to ensure that as we move into a digital world that access to knowledge and information becomes more equitably available rather than less. That we think that it would be a terrible, terrible loss if as we move from analog to digital modes of communication and sharing and learning, uh, if, if access becomes more locked down rather than less. Um, and, and I guess within that, I wanna reflect both on the report and since we're in this mode of kind of reflecting on the year since lockdown, some of the things I've been hearing around the field, both from some of our, the partners we have across the country and, and, and generally. I think first is, you know, more, I've heard the term digital equity more in the last six months than I had in the previous, I don't know, six years. Um, and this notion that a library's digital strategy cannot be separate or cleaved from its equity and inclusion strategy is more and more apparent. And I think that was made manifest in some of the data in the report, you know, the notion that uh, African-American respondents to, it, to the survey were twice as likely to report unreliable in internet than white respondents. That's a national crisis. And that's a national crisis that libraries need to stand, can be part of the solution to. And, and, and we're not fulfilling our missions if we don't take that on. Um, I think the second uh, learning that I'm hearing from lots of folks in the field from the last year is that it's incumbent upon us to own our digital branches. That, that for too long, we've enabled uh, for-profit commercial vendors to be our foray for content uh, and conversation for our digital presence uh, with our patrons. Um, DPLA is very privileged to be part of a national effort uh, initiated by IMLS and with lots of support from Sloan Foundation, um, attempting to build a collaborative platform that'll enable libraries to own our own digital future going forward. And I think that that realization of the importance of, of you know, the experience that so many of us have had 
where our entire experience, our entire library engagement was through digital through much of the year, I think has given us an opportunity really to, to reclaim not just the digital future, but the digital present. The last bit, I wanted to pick up something Doran touched on that you know, I think, and, and, that, and tie it to something in the report. Um, libraries are an incredible asset for this moment in American history. At the same time, present company accepted, as I look at some of the other library voices that I get to be a part of with this panel, we've not done a very good, and as the report makes note, we don't always do a very good job of, of explaining, sharing, and touting what, we, what our capabilities are. And at this moment in time with these sort of triple crises we have in terms of civic mistrust, in terms of uh, you know, the national conversation about uh, the inequity and in access to, to, to broadband and to content, and the lack of common places to come together across civic divisions, uh, libraries are an asset to, all three, to solve all three of those crisis moments. And it's incumbent upon us both to tell that story, but also change who we are, how we do our work, and how we talk about it in such a way that we are more greatly perceived to, to, to be part of that solution. I think we've got an incredible opportunity right now with national leadership, including uh, folks you're going to hear from shortly. Um, and, and if we don't lean in to seize this moment now, shame on us. And I think this report helps put a spotlight on, on some of those opportunities. Great, thank you very much, John. And now we turn to Jean-Claude Rizard. Jean-Claude. John, thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, the new president and CEO of Digital Promise, this is about three and a half weeks into the position. Uh, most recently, I was at the Gates Foundation. For those who don't know Digital Promise, um, we are a global 501c3. It was created out of an act of Congress under George W. Bush and physically launched under uh, President Obama. Uh, we live at the intersection of research, practice, and innovation. We do a lot of work around the digital um, uh, gap. So one uh, aligned with everything in the report, so many things in there frankly resonated. Um, to give you an, an example of, of an experience I had a few years ago in Renton, Washington, uh, I was touring the community um, and had the opportunity to walk into uh, one of the local libraries in, in Renton. The place was teeming with middle school kids, some lower high school, but mostly middle school kids uh, who were studying, socializing, doing a ton of, ton of different things. Um, the second largest group I saw were adults who were at various stages of research and, and reading, et cetera. But the place, frankly, was serving as a quasi out of school time provider uh, for a lot of kids in, in that community. And if you know anything about Renton, it's also pretty, has a pretty large immigrant population. So really for me was a microcosm of what quickly we see in so many of our communities, a safe place for Wi-Fi, a place for kids to continue the schoolwork, a place to be where parents were at work, and of course, a place for adults to find information. I can only imagine what happened, frankly, after schools shut down um, because of the pandemic. And by the way, Renton Public Schools was the first school in, in the nation to actually close um, um, in, in, after the pandemic. Um, la last spring, many of us in education uh, talked with three R's, respond, recover, reinvent. You know, no one wants to go back to normal because normal wasn't working for a lot of our kids, especially our poor Black, Latino, and Indigenous population. Uh, so, for example, we know that there are massive disparities before the pandemic. So let me focus on two things uh, related to the issue that we're talking about. Uh, one is we do know how to properly close the digital gap. Um, let me let me add a bit to that. The Boston Consulting Group did a, uh, quite a bit of work for us at the Gates Foundation. Uh, one is we know that the long-term digital divide impacts 15 to 16 million US K-12 students and three to four million post-secondary students, of course, with, with variation by geography, race, and income. While many of us, many actors in the field um, are taking heroic action to close the gap since March, uh, at best in K-12, we've closed 20 to maybe 40% of the connectivity divide and 40 to 60% of the device divide and post-secondary efforts, of course, have had some impact, largely through the distribution of student aid and devices. But the one thing that is, is, is worthy of underlining is that most of the progress is temporary. Uh, we know, for example, that 90% of the solutions will expire in one to three years. 
due to limited funding and or lack of a plan for repairs and replacement. Uh, affordability, uh, you know, but nearly 50% of disconnected students, especially black and urban students are unable to pay for services. Um, we know that 15 to 25%, um, especially native, uh, indigenous students and rural students lack coverage to, to wired or fixed wireless broadband. Uh, and about 15 to 40% have barriers beyond availability and cost. Uh, no fixed address. We know a lot of our kids are exper experiencing uh, housing instability. So no fixed address, low digital literacy and language barriers. So that leads me to figure so talk about um, some of the things that I know we can we can do. Um, we know that the divide is a fundamental um, equity issue. Enclosing it uh, is essential to the future of our economy and our society. This is not just a nice to do. Um, we know this really uh, is the fundamental underlining of what we have to do for our society. Closing the divide reduces learning inequities and is a contributing element to breaking the cycle of poverty. Um, so again, there are three things we have to focus on. One is affordability. Second is availability. And of course, adoption. And some of you guys in the chat will talk a little bit about, about that. We have an example of Digital Promise. Uh, with a partnership at Verizon actually has been demonstrating how this work should, should be happen. Uh, we call it the Verizon uh, Innovative Learning Schools. We're now in about 500 schools. We'll be in about 600 schools by the end of the calendar year. Um, and it focuses on a number of different things. So hotspots, full access to devices and hotspots for two years. Right now we're rolling out 5G across many communities. Um, but the most important part of the of, of that work is not just the device, the devices and the, the hotspot, but it's the professional learning that's given to teachers uh, and principals. So they know how to integrate the work into what they actually do. Um, and of course, there's a stipend to continue the work of refresh and everything else, including by the way, the kind of micro credentials for kids. Last thing I'll say very quickly is I would, I would encourage us to, to, to push is that when you look at schools and school districts, we have lost a lot of libraries over the last, say, five to 10 years. New York City has lost nearly half of the school-based libraries. Those were advocates who made sure that there was connection between the school and the library infrastructure. We've got to push out on our policy uh, infrastructure to reinstate and bring those things back into our schools. Thank you very much, John claude Now we turn to Tracy Hall of the American Libraries Association. Tracy. Thank you so much. Um, time is brief, but I want to uh, piggyback on one thing that um, Jean just spoke to. Um, in Philadelphia, where the American Library Association was founded, we were there last year, and in Philadelphia, our uh, birth home uh, for the association, there were only nine schools in the entire city that still had staffed school libraries. So I, I, I cannot um, say enough that we have seen um, in, in my 20 year career, the decimation of, of school libraries and school library funding, and, and we must fight for school libraries. I'm delighted to be here today and to congratulate uh, the New America Foundation. This report is all about access and equity and the deeper notion of social responsibility. And that is where this report speaks to the heart of ALA's values. At a high level, there are three areas that I wanna draw out from the New America report that align well with ALA's current work. One, the recognition that libraries have sometimes been carriers of racism and bias, the racism and bias that has compounded, uh, I think, literacy, information, and technology disparity. This truth is the impetus for ALA's five-year strategy letter, Legacy Be Justice, which I will talk about later. The issue of broadband access to and its ongoing impact on inequitable education, employment, and healthcare outcomes. I just want to point out that we are now a time in our social trajectory where both where the three education, employment, and healthcare. Uh, I think three of our primary quality of life uh, indicators are all dependent on uh, digital platforms. This is why in January the ALA Council voted to declare access to broadband a, a human right. And finally. Three, the need to rethink dramatically, I would say, library outreach, especially connecting information disinvestment with broader community disinvestment. We have not always connected the two. And I think we do need to create engagement models as uh, New America's report speaks to that bring the library collections, technology and resources into greater proximity with. And I think we must focus on low income adult heads of households whose 
economic mobility is the greater predictor of generational poverty. So at ALA, when we're focusing on outreach and outreach models, we are really focusing on those adult heads of households. So I want to just uh, deep dive very quickly into the report's point that the generational harms that the libraries segregate history and classism is one that the field must contend with and repair if we are to main, remain relevant and resonant with our communities. And we must talk again about the generations of compulsory illiteracy and how they have contributed to the achievement gap. We don't always locate the two and how they are uh, contributing to over incarceration. There is evidence, uh, of course, that African, Asian, Latino, and indigenous peoples and those from lower income and rural communities communities, as the report speaks to, tend to rely on libraries for more critical information needs. The report answers, the report's answers mesh with ALA's five-year framework, Let Our Legacy Be Justice, as well as the work we've been doing on information redlining. And as I uh, get ready to close here, I want to I want to talk about the fact that it is critical to pay attention to information redlining. Sociologists call redlining the practice of arbitrary arbitrarily denying or limiting financial services to specific neighborhoods because its residents are people of color or are poor. We believe that information redlining builds on that definition and is the continual denial of equitable access to information, information services, and information retrieval methods. So as we think about that, as we talk about uh, access, as we talk about uh, socioeconomic mobility, we are going to have to reconstruct um, a notion of libraries that uh, includes, but is not limited to um, our bricks and mortar. We need our bricks and mortar because of the history of spatial exclusion that is tandem in tandem with racism in this country, but we also need to rethink how we move into proximity with the needs of our users. So I'll stop there and pick up more in our conversation. Thank you, Tracy, for those very powerful remarks. And we have as the final panelist, Kelvin Watson, from Nevada, Kelvin. Thank you, John. And uh, again, congratulations to uh, the New Americas Foundation. And um, certainly I'm happy to, uh, I guess, wrap up with the practical uh, pieces of the, of the report. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the work that we did in Broward County. And I'm also gonna talk about some um, plans and ideas that I have here as the new Las Vegas Clark County uh, Library District Executive Director. I'm on my fifth week here. Um, so what, what I want to start off saying is what drew me to this profession, and that is um, my unwavering belief that libraries can create a future of equity, diversity, and inclusion through technology and innovation. These are certainly things that I've focused on throughout my, throughout my career. And so as I've had the opportunity to work at Queens Library and, and Broward Library and, and now at, at um, Las Vegas Clark County, the idea of, about expanding digital services has just been really at the forefront, right? So we in Broward, for example, we had already been putting some things in place to provide a virtual library experience to our e-resources. So we had already been doing pop-up libraries, for example, on buses so that we could ex expand those resources to individuals who were primarily using that mode of transportation. We also pushed out an airport location and provided um, airport uh, library resources even at uh, parks. So we had begun to see from you know just the experiences of our digital shifts more and more from the physical aspects to digital even partnering with some of the recommendations that were made in the report, like working more closely with uh, schools. So in 2017, we implemented a program with the Broward County Schools, where we worked with, uh, with that school system, sharing our digital resources through the Community Share uh, Program. So when the pandemic hit, we actually were able to, we already had 80, about 80,000 students um, that had digital library cards, we saw our digital resources increase, that usage increased by about 70% just in that particular area uh, alone, focused on the, on the youth. Some of the things that we had also been doing to work to uh, bridge and close the digital divide, and these, some of these have been already mentioned you know, from a higher level, but these are the practical things that we did. We began lending digital tablets 
preloaded with school library content as well as job assistance resources, making that tool a family uh, resource so that, you know, as Tracy mentioned, you know, moving um, moving uh, uh, the family, the, 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 the parents to, to employment or helping them become reemployed. We also were lending hotspots to veterans. So we had been you know, looking at these things already and trying to increase that digital, uh, that pres that digital presence and now focusing on moving more to workforce development. So I'm here um, in uh, Las Vegas Clark County and already starting to begin uh, those conversations. Um, again, taking the taking recommendations recommendations that from the report. Uh, meet having already had a meeting with the school superintendent last week. Um, reaching out to Nellis Air Force Base, for example, um, to put a, a, a digital library uh, there. I'm having a meeting actually later this week with the uh, uh, the bus um, the bus folks here in, in Las Vegas. So again, expanding beyond where we are to actually get those digital resources into people's hands so that we can improve people's lives. To me, the library has always represented a uh, community gathering place. And we remain that in spite of the challenges of the pandemic. Um, but as you know, we are so much more than a physical space or books on the shelves. The library is a state of mind, a hologram of possibilities and a key community influencer. And so what I continue to work on and my colleagues continue to work on, and we do this through partnerships, is providing that accessibility, discovery, and delivery of content so that we can have a more equitable uh, uh, society. That's it, thank you. Thank you very much, Calvin. We've had a lot of excellent observations, both on the report and where libraries fit today in society. We have a few minutes for discussion and I might just start out by throwing out a question to the panelists, which is, um, Let's say you're thinking about, oh, a stimulus package um, or an infrastructure bill, and you had a chance to talk to policymakers, senators from your state about where libraries fit in and how libraries can help address some of the problems we're facing as we as a society come out of a pandemic in the context of the societal challenges with respect to equity that we all see. So what would you say to your senator in terms of an ask in an infrastructure bill? And I'll just let someone start out and we'll uh, maybe go around. Um, maybe we'll go in reverse order for a quick one minute reaction to that, starting with Kelvin and then uh, Tracy, Jean-Claude, and then John. So John, I'm thinking about two things when you when you ask when you're asking that question. One is a focus on our schools and our our youth, our pre-K. That's one area, and another area would be on workforce development. Those are the those are the two things that I immediately think of. That's that's two spectrums. That's the that's the beginning, <laughs> and then it's later in in life. Uh, you know, in in really trying to um, to focus. Um, in a in a more positive, impactful way. So that's what I would say. Tracy? Yeah, and I will pick that up too. I, um, Kelvin and I have talked about this as well. I think that we have to focus on reskilling. Uh, we have seen statistics that say that by 2025, we could have up to 76 of the Black and Latino community combined underprepared or unprepared un, un, uh, for jobs as they become hybrid, as they become more remote. Um, and so I think we need to focus on reskilling. And second, I think that we have to make interventions in terms of the monies that are going to the Department of Justice. We have to see preemptive strategies to bring more of those monies into library services so that we can interrupt the school to prison pipeline. John claude do you have a thought? Absolutely. Um, let me just add two things. Uh, one, I would, we know that they, to close the digital gap takes about six to $11 billion. Uh, and then of course, two to three billion every year, just to make sure that we have the kind of sustained long-term effect around this. The second, I would, I would really lean on the state education departments in thinking about school libraries uh, to perhaps begin to reverse the trend that we know uh, actually exists. And 
in really supporting superintendents and school principals who really understand the value uh, and begin to rebuild that infrastructure. So both the gap and of course, looking at um, the, the school district infrastructure and school libraries. John Bracken, do you have a thought? Yeah, well, I would say, I mean, one, we are so, in addition to Tracy and her, her colleagues, we are so lucky to have the type of national leadership that we have right now representing libraries in Washington. Um, actually, I'll use that as a plug. You know, one, of the, one of our key assets in the field is Crosby Kemper at IMLS, and he's going to be part of the, a meeting we're doing, our, our open community board meeting next month, which I'll put it in the chat, but it's at the bit.ly slash DPLA open board. Um, and then I guess the last bit that I said that's related, you know, related to that, but I just think I, I want to come back and recircle it is that in order for us to have that level of impact, we have just as we would not rent out or give away or sell our physical in person uh, branches, we can no longer give up and and lease our way and give away our digital uh, face to to our public and to our patrons. Um, and, and if we didn't know that before, we should know that today from a year ago. That That's excellent. Another question we may want to consider is the issue of community content. Um, I think in the chat, as I try to multitask, I see some people asking uh, not just about broadband access, but about devices. Um, and, you know, John claude has talked about that in terms of the cost of supporting that for communities. But when you get to access and devices, you get to the what for. We've talked a bit about what users may receive. But uh, Tracy, I think, especially hit on uh, information, informational redlining. We have for a different panel, maybe one day, the, the issue of local news organizations being gutted. So maybe we could uh, start with Tracy, since I can see the body language, even on Zoom, wanting to jump in on the notion of content creation. Yeah, I mean, there's so much to say. And I would, I definitely believe we're moving into a mode where we have to think about co-creation and co-curation with our communities. Um, I can almost even stop there, but I do think that we've only touched, I think, the head of the of the needle um, when it when it comes to the kinds of content that is actually going to draw and resonate with, with our communities. And I, I love the fact that the report really honors that and says that we are not really dot, uh, mining our complete talent um, or even our mind, our, our genius mind, I would say. But I, I, I think that we have to push, that's why I'm really pushing very hard that for, for really diversifying the ranks of the profession. We, I, I believe that if we continue, we will be out of step and, and maybe in danger of being irrelevant um, or at least not resonant with our community. So that co-creation and co-curation also means that we have to think about who is decision making for uh, libraries and actually how do we think about libraries being embedded in their communities and literally of their communities. Other reactions to that? Johnny, sorry, Jean-Claude. So I, I, would, I would just double down on what Tracy's been talking about. When I think about the reinvention part of, of the three R's I was mentioning before, where I see the, the real long-term effect is gonna be on sort of content on curriculum and that range, the, the broad range of that. It's not just K-12, think about the adult learning, uh, the micro-credentialing that actually happening, giving people access to information and know how to use information is critical. The technology is a means to that end. It is necessary, but insufficient. Without the content build, both for K-12 students and for a dozen families, frankly, who are now, who have now seen the inside of schools from their homes, um, have parents support kids um, without that kind of pedagogical and curricular creation, um, we're not gonna go anywhere. I'll just uh, close out with a final observation, if I may. Um, no good report in, doesn't inspire other future good reports. And I'm hopeful that New America is able to revisit this topic in the future uh, to see how people view their libraries as we quote unquote return to normal. And we know that the post pandemic normal is going to look different than what came before it given uh, all the changes that have ensued. But um, I, I think 
among the biggest contributions of this report is the need to keep an eye from a research perspective on where libraries are and where the public thinks libraries are um, as the role of libraries continue to evolve. So with that, um, I would like us to have a Zoom round of applause for an excellent uh, set of panelists. Uh, we really appreciate your, your comments and your wisdom. And with that, I will uh, turn this back over to uh, Lisa and New America. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, John, and everybody on the panel really appreciate it. There's a lot of food for thought there. That concept, the co-creation co and the in the building and participatory uh, content building is something that's very um, resonant with us at New America as well on several projects. So it's exciting to start talking about that and what it means to really embed in and um, get participation from all aspects of community instead of those who are um, maybe more traditionally connected to their libraries. So I'm um, really pleased to have a moment to, to move us over to our next panel. And I, I first though want to um, note that some good questions have come in the chat and thank you all so much for, for doing that. Continue to add some questions in there. There were a few questions and I know that um, John didn't have time to get to, to many of them at all, but one question came in around the report itself and I just wanted to, to answer that for you all. It was about um, why the report may have focused entirely on how users access resources, um, it, like just basically getting online in the first place rather than aspects of digital collections. Um, and I did wanna note that there were some questions in our survey that went a little bit deeper. It wasn't just about whether you knew about the website or used a, a app like a, a Libby that an app that a library might've made available to you. But there were also questions about once you got into the library's digital resources, um, whether you were able to kind of find what you wanted and who were able to kind of get to the ebook that you were looking for, et cetera. So I encourage you to, to look at the data from that. It's um, not as much of a, a pretty picture yet. There were definitely some challenges people were having in getting down to what they actually really were looking for when they went to the library. So happy to, to talk more about that too. So I'm going to move it now to um, our second panel. Um, and this is exciting um, for us because we can really start thinking about solutions and um, and bounce off a little bit of what um, we heard from Kelvin in terms of where libraries already are and what they're trying to do next. So I'm going to introduce Linda Poon, who is our um, moderator for this next panel, and I'm going to turn it over to you, Linda. Linda is a staff writer for Bloomberg City Lab, where she has written on a host of urban issues, including urban development, climate and the environment, and just last week, community responses to anti-Asian violence in the wake of the murders in Atlanta. We at New America have been following Linda because of a story she wrote back in June, how the coronavirus is changing public libraries. And that story hit on so many of the issues we're talking about now. She was very, very ahead of her time <laughs> in writing that piece. Um, so thank you, Linda, for that piece. And I'm now gonna turn it over to you to introduce the next panel. Great, thank you so much, Lisa. Um, I'm really excited to moderate this panel. My own reporting has sort of brought my attention to a lot of different innovations out there. And um, I'm really excited for this um, these panelists to talk a little bit more about what their institutions are doing. Um, so with that, we have really four, uh, four really great guests today. Um, and so please allow me to introduce um, one of them is Paulo Balboa, the program manager at the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. Um, we also have Jenny Jeremy Markham, assistant director of the Catawba County Public Library in North Carolina. Anita Jennings, acting director of Newport News Public Library in Virginia. And Michelle Jeske, president of the Public Libraries Associations and the director of Denver Public Library in Colorado. So thank you all for being here um, and a big welcome to everyone. Um, so I want to start with um, just having you guys talk a little bit about what programs you guys have been offering, right, um, throughout the pandemic. We know there's a lot of adaptations, a lot of pivoting. So let's start, um, I'll also go in alphabetical order. Um, let's start with um, Paulo. 
Thanks for having us. Uh, thanks, thanks, Linda, for the introduction. Uh, happy to be included on this panel presentation, uh, and also just want to extend my congratulations to Do America on publishing this report. Um, it's been a real pleasure to be a part of the working group for the report and to learn from my colleagues who are so talented, so experienced, and it's just been uh, a real delight. Um, just a little bit about me and the sort of work that uh, I do with the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. Um, officially, we've been around since 2015, but myself, my coworkers there, and our network of affiliates have been doing this work in some shape or form for much longer than that. Um, maybe it just hasn't been called digital inclusion. But everything that we do, we do uh, in lockstep with our affiliates. So one of those things is defining this work. Like, what do we mean by digital inclusion and digital equity? And then how did that change last March when the pandemic hit? Um, one of the analogies that we like to use is this analogy of the three-legged stool to uh, describe affordable broadband, affordable devices, as well as digital literacy training. We view those as the activities necessary to, to get to this framework of digital equity. We know that not everyone is there. That's why we're here to, to sort of do that work and advocate for uh, resources and policy to, to make a more um, digitally equitable uh, solution. Affordable broadband, right, like some of the panelists were mentioning earlier, is this idea of availability versus adoption that's mentioned in, in the report as well. Uh, income is a big driver of you know, trying to figure out who isn't uh, adopting internet at home. Just because there's wires in the ground, uh, that an ISP provides, that doesn't mean that that uh, internet connection is necessarily being used by folks. Household income can be a main, main barrier to digital inclusion. One way to address that is discount internet offers like a Comcast Internet Essentials, AT&T's Internet Access Plan, for instance. The idea of devices refers to net local national computer refurbishers, device hotspot lenders, right? But then as, and to go deeper into what the report like really, really digs into, I think, well, is this idea of this elusive third leg of the stool, that idea of digital literacy, just training on how to use those devices and how to use the internet. The digital literacy piece, uh, I think, represents what I would say that is the human component of digital equity work. It's nice to get somebody signed up for home broadband service. It's nice to make sure that they have a Chromebook in their hands, but who can they call on if they don't know how to use those devices? A place like a public library has traditionally fit that digitally equitable, equitable space. It fits those three legs of the stool with public computer centers, with uh, reliable internet. And then most importantly, and I think having staff trained to help uh, patrons and community members get to the resources that they need. Uh, in the past year, NDIA has piloted a program that we're calling Digital Navigators with several different types of uh, social service organizations across the country. We've been working with economic development uh, in Appalachia. We've been working with uh, workforce development in Ohio. But most importantly, and I may be biased because my background is in public libraries, we're piloting this program with the Salt Lake City Public Library with help from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Since the very beginning of that project, uh, the program leadership over there, just shout out to Shana Edson and Justin Strange, who are absolute all-stars. Program leadership at the Salt Lake City Public Library has been uh, intentional about making sure that they're partnering with community-based organizations in Salt Lake City that already serve historically underserved, underrepresented community members. So they're partnering with an organization called the Catholic Community Services of Utah, which is a social service organization that helps migrants and refugees community members in Salt Lake City. They're also partnering with community-based organizations that emphasize business development for the Hispanic and Spanish-speaking community in Salt Lake City. The goal of Digital Navigators is to develop this replicable framework for organizations, maybe like other public libraries, maybe like other social services organizations that want to be able to continue to serve their community members, their clients, their patrons uh, in this pandemic age. Uh, just to, to begin to wrap up, I know we can have a conversation around this. Uh, the pandemic has exposed like these major, major gaps in, the, in digital equity. Uh, historically underrepresented, historically underserved communities are at risk of being left even further behind now that we have the stronger reliance on using the internet. So fingers crossed, but as the country continues to trend towards higher vaccine rollout and Maybe the end is in sight, big, big fingers crossed. Uh, and as, especially as public libraries can consider full or partial reopening, um, 
I don't, I think that the components that we've seen come up in a digital navigators program, like a remote service can, can and may stay in a, in what looks like a post pandemic world. Um, being able to, you know, close that gap for community members who may not be able to leave the home and digital navigators representing like a, a remote way of reaching them is something that I think uh, could be integrated into library programming moving forward. Great, thank you, Paulo. And I, I do think that sort of digital literacy conversation um, is less talked about, right, than the other other stools. Um, so next we have Jenny Jeremy Markham. Thank you, Linda. So um, my name is Jenny. I'm from Catawba County, North Carolina, very rural. 90% of our schools are considered Title I schools. And we have a service population of about 115,000. So like all of you addressing these access issues and reaching our underserved populations has always been a guiding force for our library. And I feel like our pre-COVID foundation of being outward focused and attuned to their community needs, along with com collaborating with other community agencies, helped us to shift very quickly. So when COVID shut down schools and businesses, our library staff was deemed essential by our county. And I believe that came from a longstanding practice of aligning our library goals with our county's goals and strategic plan. So for example, our county had a health and wellness initiative. So our library began offering exercise programs and worked with our public health to address issues that they found in the community health assessment through our programming. When our county had a placemaking initiative, we partnered with our parks to install literacy trails and story walks. When they have an educational initiative, each of our library has an outcome to partner with schools and teachers to help them teach one of their curriculum objectives. So once the county was shut down in just a few short days, we began our curbside service. And as one of the Johns had said earlier, we needed it to be all things to all people, both physically and digitally. So our staff remained in the building to answer phones and to provide one-on-one -on -one assistance for tech, for job and career, and for those unemployment questions. Um, we served as those na digital navigators that Paolo was talking about. Our library buildings then reopened day one, phase one. Um, not easy to do, but we did it. And um, the success of that was heavily dependent upon the many and deep relationships that we had fostered with other departments, community groups, and businesses. Like others on this panel, we'll continue to look at the needs of the community and then put those programs and ideas into place to address those needs. So our Wi-Fi had always been on 24 seven, but we did increase our signal strength. We shifted our budgets to increase those electronic resources. We added more resources. We already had a hot hotspot and laptop lending programs in place, but thanks to more grant funding, we bought Samsung Wi-Fi enabled tablets, and that was able to allow us to ensure more access because we were already partnering with our schools, as mentioned earlier, library media coordinators were able to contact us directly and say, I've got this kiddo that needs this, or, or I've got these parents that need this. We had those pre-established relationships in place. So being responsive to our patrons' needs and requests, we also tried to figure out how we could delve into programming. So like many of you, we offered pre-recorded programming, then went to live online platforms. We created make and takes. And then um, thankfully being in North Carolina, we were able to look at outside programming. And that's part of what the report focused on. Um, we were able to add Zumba into our parking lots, Tai Chi into, and hiking into our parks. We have programming in our community gardens. We've been able to promote our story walks and literacy trails as a safe way to engage in early literacy opportunities. Again, leaning into those pre-established partnerships. But that's not enough because that's still expecting the public to come to us. So with the goal of meeting people where they are, one of the programs that I think was most responsive from us was we were able to partner with community agencies and through LST a funding, we now provide Wi-Fi in the community. We supply the access points at public housing sites, recreational departments, soup kitchens, local churches and businesses that are in specifically targeted areas. 
We're also hosting social workers and community navigators in our library. Again, thanks to funding from our state library. And our social work students come from nearby universities. They have regular office hours and they make themselves available for drop-in appointments, drop-in visits or appointments. And they're well equipped to provide support and help with navigating these processes. They're also training our library staff though, so that our library staff can do the same job they can in case they're busy. We're looking to expand in the future with library outposts. Um, we're talking about setting up in a laundry facility with a book vending machine, regular visits from our mobile library, which is our library to go, and programming done in conjunction with our other partners. We're still working for digital library cards so that we have students that can have direct access using their own logins. And um, we're also working for more online classes and in-person classes eventually for caregivers um, that will allow access to more digital navigating and, and technology learning. So Great, right. thank, oh. thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, I think this idea of like taking services literally out of the building is obviously a huge part of the conversation right now, right? Um, so thank you for that. Um, next, we have Anita Jennings. Good afternoon. The, this report and the discussion this afternoon highlight the importance of what libraries bring to any community. I just want to share with you some of the experiences that we had at the City of Newport News at the onset of the pandemic. When the pandemic first hit, um, the city of Newport News, we're a department within the city of Newport News, the city closed down for public, uh, public could not come into the building, the schools closed and many local businesses closed. At the very beginning, we assumed that the schools were just closed, maybe an early spring break. We did not realize that they would not return to online learning until actually this month. So we knew we have three libraries and we knew that we were the main place for many of our communities in order to access the internet. We have, we're a SNAP center. So we provide assistance with individuals looking for jobs as well as individuals trying to apply for unemployment. So when the school system closed, one of the things that they had to do was do the online learning. For some students that was seamless. But for many students in some of our communities, they did not have the access to online. Um, they didn't have access. And then they did not have uh, anyone in the home that could actually assist them with their schoolwork. We have three libraries, like I said, and most of the libraries were very active in our community. So we knew that there was a need within the community. We did some of the same things that many of the other libraries have done in, across the country. We, added curbside service. We went to virtual programming. We also increased our digital collection, but that still was not meeting the need for the uh, digital divide and the digital equity issues. So one of the programs that we implemented to try to reach more individuals was a mobile hotspot program. Since the city was closed, we have a fleet of vehicles. Other departments weren't using those vehicles so each of our libraries was able to get a vehicle and have that vehicle housed on at the library site. We would go out with the uh, two Wi-Fi hotspots, two staff members per vehicle, and deliver service to where the school buses were delivering lunches. We also packed materials, book materials, so that we could have those so that the students could pick up those as well during that time. So once we did that, we were able to meet the needs. We had individuals coming, doing homework, turning in assignments. We had people coming in, checking email, trying to apply for their unemployment insurance. It just highlighted the importance of the opening of a library and what libraries do provide to the community. At this point, we are still closed. We are planning for reopening. Uh, we should be opening next month but we still, we have rolled out uh, a hotspot program in all of our libraries. At the onset of this program, we had uh, piloted a hotspot program for one of our neighborhoods, the um, Ridley Place neighborhood. 
and we only had a few library hotspots, but since there, there was such a need, we were able to purchase more hotspots to be able to deliver those to individuals. The school system also at that time, they purchased more hotspots because most of the kids had a device, but they did not have the internet. So it just highlighted so quickly the differences of, of our communities and how quickly some communities can adapt and how, how some are left behind and the importance of the work that we still need to do to try to continue to um, bridge that digital divide. But we are meeting the needs of the community, but there are some things that we would like to continue to do as we learn more, as, as more resources become available and bring that to the community. Thank you so much, Anita. Um, one of my favorite things about this is just it really highlights this need for collaboration, right, across different departments. Um, you partner with school, you partner with other uh, departments to use their vehicle fleets, which is amazing. Um, and then last but not least, we, we have Michelle Jeske. Great, thank you for having me. Um, first, I'm representing the Public Library Association today, but I'm also, I'm gonna speak a little bit about what we've been doing here in Denver at the Denver Public Library. And like uh, many others today, I would just want to thank New America and everyone involved in this research and report. It is really helpful, I think, to libraries as we think about how to move forward, but also to those we work with and others may, we may want to work with or who may want to work with us as we come out of this really difficult year. I think it points in some directions that we all, we all need to pay attention to. The report also really aligns with what PLA's own research last year showed, how libraries immediately work to pivot programs and services online and also out in the community when buildings close to the public. And as my fellow panelists just really well just demonstrated, library staff served communities virtually, yes, but also already recognized how many people lack broadband access at all and connected people out where they were, in parking lots, on sidewalks, in lots of partnerships with schools and housing authorities and other places, and really in some very creative ways as we've just heard. In Denver, we've been taking hotspots and laptops out to safe outdoor spaces for people experiencing homelessness and um, also supporting them in the use of those devices. We've purchased and circulated additional Wi-Fi hotspots and laptops specifically for our immigrant and refugee community to use at home. And also again, as uh, Paulo and others talked about, it's also the digital literacy piece to really help support them in the use of it. And then lastly, um, we're in the process of purchasing several hundred smartphones with a year of data prepaid to give away to people experiencing homelessness with no strings attached. They will be preloaded with apps and links to useful resources and we'll be working with them through digital navigators. Much of that is to address the immediate needs that we've been speaking about this morning, but also to see what works and to evaluate and really figure out how to work toward longer term solutions. And as part of that, our library is co-leading our city's digital equity planning along with the Office of Economic Development. For this year, our library committed to prioritizing the most vulnerable among us, the unhoused, the unemployed, black, indigenous, and people of color, and older adults, just to name some of the populations that we've identified, and of course, all the intersections among them. And so that means we're rethinking how we spend our money, what programs and services we provide, and yes, the hard part, figuring out some things that we're going to have to let go so that we can really work toward racial and social equity. As this report really lays out well, this pandemic has laid bare the deep rooted inequities in our communities, as well as the resourcefulness of public libraries and their staffs and also how important our public spaces and resources are to the community. We need to be really creative about our existing physical and digital resources. Our physical spaces are going to be more important than ever as we re-knit our social infrastructure, as we help people upskill and reskill for employment and recover from learning loss. 
If passed, the Build America's Libraries Act currently being considered in Congress could really help ensure that public libraries can expand technology access, host vital community meetings, enable telehealth, and improve accessibility, energy efficiency, and resiliency in all of our communities. So we are really excited by the opportunities that ALA and library advocates were able to secure through the American Rescue Plan Act, including funding for libraries through IMLS and funding for the emergency connectivity funding. These opportunities are really exciting and important, but we also need to think about the sustainability of funding and support for public libraries. We need to ensure we continue to maintain local funding support because we cannot afford to lose staff or library hours as we recover from pandemic losses and the inequ economic inequity that both preceded it and is now exacerbated by it. Our communities need strong libraries and strong libraries need strong support. And libraries cannot be the fixer of all things. So how do we work better together with our local government and other community partners to bring our strengths and assets together in smart, efficient ways to best support our community members, not duplicating efforts, but enhancing each other's work, creating true collaborations and collective impacts. The pain we've experienced and the resilience we've shown this last year should be the catalyst for transformation and growth. Libraries can and should improve our outreach and visibility, particularly within communities of color and low income communities. And our educational and nonprofit colleagues should look to libraries as partners for technology access and skills building. I just wanna end by thanking all the librarians on the panel and out in the audience for what you've done and what you will do. And thanks to our many partners and supporters. Back to you, Linda. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, I really love this idea of, you know, well, it leads directly to my next question, which is that libraries themselves cannot be the fixture of all for all problems, right? There is support that um, not just funding, but sort of pol broader policy support that are needed. And I do want to talk a little bit more about what you guys kind of want from your local government, from federal government, um, as well from some of these these partnerships that we've been kind of talking about like what do libraries need in order to do the role recognizing that they cannot be the only solution to the problem um maybe let's throw it out um whoever wants to talk next <laughs> maybe throw out to paulo again sure yeah um I think so it, it does come down to funding like we, libraries need more money right but like I think that one way to put that into action like how to make that the use of funding most effective is to recognize that as has been mentioned several times already on uh, during today's webinar uh, libraries represent like the community trusting a public institution like having a public library in an area uh, and using their their strengths which i think is community trust uh and you know trained staff who are there to assist community members or library patrons with whatever they need that's the way to really dig in into using uh funding most effectively just to dig in a little bit harder digital navigators is one way to try to do that right like building staff capacity to make you know more of those resources available to the community members who need it most and housing those resources inside of a library i think you know doesn't put all of the onus on the public library but rather uses their strengths um, the best I agree. I think, you know, including the library, and this comes up in the report, including the library at the table to talk about these big important things so that we can share the assets and strengths that we have, um, being proactive about that, um, and honestly addressing through other agencies and other funding, other um, people who have other expertise uh, and not just having a lot of the challenges fall at the public library because anybody can walk in the door. I feel like we have inherited a, a safety net that is not sustainable. 
and um, others need to step up a bit. I agree. I think it's very important that libraries have a seat at the table and to be part of the solution. I think some communities don't recognize all that the library has to offer when you are trying to come up with solutions to some of these problems that we're trying to solve that are much greater than the public library. But I think we absolutely can be part of the solution and should be. And there is nothing else to say on that subject. <laughs> um, the other thing I'm really interested in, um, I know we're running out of time, but I do want to talk more about these collaborations with different um, entities within, right, with school libraries, with, with different departments. It's not something I personally had ever thought about. We always thought about libraries as a, you know, standalone entity, right? You go to the library, you get what you want. Um, and I'm wondering, going forward, what sort of collaborations um, will be needed? Um, what are you guys specifically looking for in your own institutions? Maybe we start with Jenny this time. I would love the idea of co-locating with social services, with the DSS, other, other departments. Um, I think that would be really neat. We already collaborate with our cooperative extension. We have a community garden. But again, if we could co-locate, that would be wonderful. Um, also, as I addressed earlier, our library outcomes and outputs um, are specifically aligned with our government's outcomes, output strategic plan so that um, we hope, not always, but we hope that they'll recognize us as essential services. So we have those, those outreaches, those collaborations built in to what we do on the daily basis. Great. Um, does, is there anyone who wants to talk a little bit about sort of what sort of collaborations they're looking forward to within their own community? Yeah, I can I can jump in uh, as well. Like uh, from the uh, like the macro perspective, I guess for digital inclusion. Like as I was describing earlier, a lot of public library represents a like a digitally equitable system because it has all of those three components of that three legs of the stool that I was mentioning. So libraries, public libraries uh, are already digital inclusion leaders in their in their local municipalities, in their local cities, towns, whether they describe themselves that way or not, right? Like the issue of language is important, but they're already doing this work. So since last year, uh, from our perspective, we've seen new types of social service organizations join the digital inclusion fold, uh, organizations that serve migrants and refugees, for instance, workforce development. Um, a lot of people are coming together to do this work, and I think that they can look to the library uh, to sort of, to, to, as, as a thought leader for this kind of space. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, I do wanna turn back to Lisa and, and just to see, um, if we have some time for a Q&A, if you guys have any Q&A questions. Um, Thanks so much, Linda. Really great to hear all of the important both collaborations, but also really creative and innovative projects underway. And this question of like how to kind of test, experiment, and gather data on what works, I think is at the top of mind as well. So we're at a key moment to really start doing that. Um, yeah, we, we have, a, a minute or two more if any big questions come in there have been some some great ones in the chat folks are also really interested in being able to follow up and see the slides and the report and so we'll make sure that that's available afterwards as well um, to everybody and hopefully there's a lot of good chatter going on on twitter i haven't been able to multitask quite in at that level yet to get back on Twitter. Um, but I, I, I do want to say one last thing while all, all of you are here, because this three-legged stool notion is really, really helpful. Paulo, thank you so much for that analogy. And this, this digital literacy piece, it would be remiss if I didn't note that in addition to the Digital Navigators program, we at New America have been writing about media mentorship as another kind of component of digital literacy. It's, it's a, a way to think about that human-centered approach to digital literacy that, that libraries can provide. And I think it really runs really nicely and in sync with digital navigators, this notion that a librarian um, can be there to help people navigate through all the different media that's out there and how to start um, making some of their own evaluations about what they see as quality and, um, and useful in the media that they're 
that they're able to get from their library or from elsewhere. So I just wanted to note that briefly. Um, I want to say a big thank you to, pa to Linda for moderating, to Paulo and Anita and Michelle and, Jer and Jenny, um, and to everyone on our first panel as well. And I think we're going to close up at this point, um, um, say a, a farewell, but there's lots more to do, a lot more work ahead. And um, it's just very inspiring to hear from all of you.